Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, good afternoon. I want to also thank the Mises Institute for inviting me. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, the political economy of policing. So what is that? Uh, so the political economy part is what, what I mean by it, actually, is the economic analysis of the institutions through which policing is provided. So what is policing? So that can refer to, I mean, what most people have in mind when they hear police, like government uh, agents enforcing laws, hopefully protecting property rights and keeping people safe. Um, but uh, not limited to just that, but also the non-state provision of uh, the enforcement of property rights uh, protection, not just both commercial, but as well as you know, people doing non-compensated labor, uh, volunteering their time in neighborhood watch or buying their security systems and cameras. So I'm trying to be uh, inclusive here. So not just your elite government police, but also your um, <laughs> elite private security. <laughs> oh, the, so what I'm doing here is uh, kind of a comparative institutional analysis, both of you know, your government provision and your non-government provision. And the, the key, the, the light by which I see everything else is through economic calculation. So uh, Dr. Salerno talked about the problem of uh, calculating under a system of socialism. But the economic calculation problem, I mean, it's not just limited to socialism. It can also occur in an otherwise you know, market-oriented, I don't know if that's a good one, well, a market economy um, when you have government agencies uh, operating within it. So um, I have a picture here of Mises' bureaucracy, which I think after this talk, everyone should go buy a copy. I'm probably going to lobby for that to be one of the books included in the box. Um, it's only 100 pages. It's uh, a great read. Uh, but how Mises defines bureaucracy is that it's uh, an entity that can't engage in economic calculation, uh, as opposed to uh, an organization managed for profit or it, that can depend on profit and loss calculation. So when we think of a, a typical government police department, it's run bureaucratically. They can't engage in profit and loss calculation. I mean, they can calculate their costs, which are meaningful, um, because they go out into the market and acquire labor, uh, some capital goods, some police cars, some guns, some tasers, these things that have market prices, that using resources that uh, other people bid for. But they can't calculate profit because uh, their revenue is disconnected from uh, the voluntary market exchange. That is, the, I mean, they mainly get it through taxes or uh, taking your stuff. Uh, otherwise, through a non-tax taxation means. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about civil asset forfeiture later. But there's this disconnect. It's not people expressing uh, their desire for government-provided uh, policing. They're not exchanging their money, demonstrating they prefer the government-provided service more than they prefer the alternative use of that money. So that's uh, a bureaucratic police department. Uh, by contrast, private security Know, bought voluntarily on the market, uh, at least in an ex-ante sense, people buying it are demonstrating they prefer those services over the alternative uses of the money that they're spending on them. And this has a lot of epistemological implications. So as I mentioned, police departments are bureaucracies that can't engage in profit and loss calculation. So they have to find some other way excuse me, of uh, measuring performance. Um, most of them, it's not like they go out and uh, collect surveys of how much people like the services they provide. They don't say they don't leave us a Yelp review. Um, they, they, don't, they don't do these things, so they mostly rely on data they just collect incidentally. Things like reported crime, arrests, clearance rates. So clearance rates being uh, when there is a reported crime, if they arrest somebody for it, they consider that a clearance. Not, not necessarily convicted for it, but uh, we arrested someone. Um, and, you know, with these figures, like, okay, reported crime went up, maybe, you know, we need more money. Uh, reported crime went down, uh, thank you, you're, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, so these things, you see, they're very uh, limited from what we can tell from these things. It's very different than profit and loss calculation, which 
you know, a, a for-profit firm can tell whether they've allocated resources to more highly valued uses. Um, and I wanted to mention the, uh, Eleanor Ostrom and her colleagues. I think they engaged in what I consider probably the best uh, social scientific research. I mean, I, it's not economics, but uh, you know, the, the, the crown jewel of the social sciences, but uh, the best they could do under the circumstances. So um, she did this starting in the 70s, so at the time, in a research question of interest, or maybe um, probably something just taken as uh, gospel, was that uh, municipal services should be consolidated. That's wasteful to have, say, like, if you think of Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, there's all kinds of little police departments. It's like, why don't we just have one big one? We'd uh, get rid of duplicative services. It'd be more efficient. You'd have better training. And so she goes out to test this question, or to the extent that it can be tested. Uh, so she was in Indiana, one of the cities she uh, researched was Indianapolis, where she'd find, um, I guess ideally you'd find comparable communities, so those uh, near Indianapolis um, receiving policing services from the Indianapolis police, comparable neighborhoods that have their own uh, independent police department, and she'd go ask people, are, are you satisfied with the police? Like, well, not just satisfied, but all kinds of things. How easy it to, is it to get in contact with the pl uh, police chief? Um, how many police officers can, can you name? Like, all these kinds of things. And then also, well, what's the cost per person? And well, she found some of them. Well, it, well, what she generally found was those with their small independent uh, police departments were generally more satisfied. Uh, sometimes they cost more. Sometimes they cost less. But from this, we can't determine, like, are consumer preferences being satisfied? As if people like it more, but it also costs more. Well, maybe people are willing to pay that. Maybe they'd prefer uh, to pay less but have uh, less preferable service. But we don't know. So I guess I bring all this up just to show uh, under a system of bureaucracy, it's extremely hard to tell whether um, people are actually satisfied, that they'd be willing to pay for these things, even with um, the best research that can be done. So by contrast, uh, now moving um, away from bureaucracy, talking about policing services being pri provided through voluntary means, economic calculation is possible. Um, even uh, in, a, in a psychic sense, there's, or I'm gonna be careful here, not calculation, but uh, people know or can know whether they've made a psychic profit. You go buy security cameras for your house, uh, you feel more protected, whatever, like you were willing to give up that money, it's like, oh, uh, resources have been allocated to more highly valued uses. Uh, commercial enterprises can engage in you know, actual arithmetic calculation when they spend money on either uh, hiring contracted police or uh, having their own um, uh, employees provide security in-house. And they can do this, um, might be in a variety of ways. Uh, in terms of additional revenue, if we make, uh, say, our business establishment, uh, you know, people feel safer, maybe they, uh, we increase revenue. I mean, it's not necessarily the case that they can tell this was the marginal contribution of greater security. Maybe uh, they can see, okay, here's before, you know, maybe we had some vagrants around and people were unsafe and or felt that and, oh, we get the security, uh, they made people feel safer, we see revenues go up. Maybe we can infer that that was the cause of this security. Or similarly with losses prevented, say we're uh, dealing with retail theft. We hire some loss prevention specialists. We can see what, what, what were our losses beforehand, what were our losses afterwards, and we have a monetary value that we can compare to what we have to pay this loss prevention guy. And you know, if we pay him less than the, uh, well, we, I guess it's a counterfactual. We don't know how much loss we're actually preventing in the counterfactual, but we can estimate it. Um, so there are these means of telling whether uh, in money terms uh, security resources are being allocated to more highly valued uses. So in thinking about a bureaucratic police department, since, a, again, going back to uh, Mises' bureaucracy, says here's for-profit management, here's bureaucratic management. Bureaucratic management can't be done according to profit and loss. So how do they make decisions? Well, if we observe them, like go look out the window, you can see a lot of the Auburn police driving around. Uh, their production process seems to be mostly, well, waiting for, they'll, they'll respond to calls for service, and when they're not doing that, they wait for calls for service, or maybe 
engage in vehicular patrol or just uh, park and have some donuts. But they mostly <laughs> wait for, you know, it's very reactive. And even when a crime does occur, they'll go uh, investigate, detectives go investigate crimes. But it's very uh, reactive. They do make some proactive decisions. Uh, they do respond to incentives. I think a good example of this is after the 1984 Crime Control Act. Uh, this like, opens some loopholes for civil asset forfeiture, um, which you might be familiar with. So civil asset forfeiture is when police can seize uh, goods that they believe have been used in or are the proceeds of a crime. So they spot you have a lot of cash in your car. That, hmm, is that drug money? And they only need a, a probable cause standard to actually seize this. And the reason they're interested in is that they can supplement their own budgets with this. Um, a lot of states require that, uh, if police do do this, I mean, they don't have to get a conviction. You know, civil asset forfeiture, not criminal asset forfeiture. Um, you know, in the state of North Carolina, for example, it's supposed to go into an education fund. Um, but this federal law made it so that police departments could bypass that. They could get in a partnership with the DEA and they'd split it 20 to the feds and 80 to the local police department. And so they decided to reallocate resources based on this. Um, I think Bruce Benson, a, a Florida state economist, he found that uh, near Tallahassee after this that police, uh, well, property crime went up. Police officers dedicated fewer resources to uh, preventing or investigating property crime and more towards uh, drug crime because that's where the money was. So they do uh, respond to incentives like this. You know, I mean, an additional example, um, Ferguson, Missouri, where uh, Michael Brown was killed. It was a DOJ investigation. They found that a lot of police departments were uh, engaged in like, writing a lot of tickets for, you know, ticky-tack stuff. You got uh, these cracks in the uh, sidewalk leading up to your house. You don't have matching blinds. Um, <laughs> that this was a way of making money. So uh, they do respond to incentives, and some of these um, have monetary rewards. But as you see, it's not connected necessarily to what consumers want um, and are willing to pay for. Uh, a couple additional institutional differences between government police and uh, non-government police that I think are important is that government policing takes, primarily, uh, takes place primarily in the public domain or uh, so-called public property, though I don't necessarily like that term, but Maybe it's more accurate than public domain because that might have the implication that it can be homesteaded. But like what I mean there, like public streets, et cetera, like uh, th these don't have a capital value. And so if you try to, I mean, you could engage in a street beautification pro project, I guess, but you wouldn't have a capital value for it because it's not traded on the market. So you can't tell whether those investments were worth doing. Um, so uh, this has implications for uh, the allocation of resources and whether we can tell whether um, certain investments are value added. A second, uh, well, or an additional, additional institutional difference is the how um, both government police are constrained and how non-government police are constrained. So government police are constrained, at least say in the American case, for example, by uh, constitutional guidelines about you know, searches and seizures, what they can do. Um, that. I, without these restrictions, maybe they'd be uh, even more um, abusive. Uh, whereas non-government police don't have these, they're not bound by the Constitution the same way. And so I'll talk about how, um, well, that affects how they engage in uh, policing, how, how differently they are constrained. So now that we've talked about some of these institutional differences, I want to talk about the implications these have for trade-offs within policing. That is, there, there are these inherent trade-offs that in a, a bureaucratic framework, we're just unable to tell whether we've found the optimum uh, of this trade-off according to what consumers want. So I'll talk about each one of these. Uh, the first, I'm decided to label uh, convenience slash dignity and security. So you're probably familiar with that Ben Franklin quote about uh, the trade-off being between liberty and security. And uh, if you trade liberty for security, that you uh, lose both and deserve neither. And I guess my argument here is like, that, that, that trade-off isn't necessarily the case. That is, if you have the liberty to choose the security you want, well then, well, you have your liberty. 
You can choose more or less security. So the, the real trade-off might be something like convenience. Uh, some mundane example is like computer passwords. Like there's a trade-off between convenience and security. Like if you're, uh, you know, using the same password for all your accounts, you know, that's more convenient, but you're probably less secure. Whereas if you want to be more secure, then uh, you might have to give up some convenience. So that's what I mean there. I don't think uh, if there's not a monopoly provider of uh, security, you don't necessarily have to give up your liberty. Um, the second one, this issue of constraints and security. Uh, that was just mentioned about constitutional constraints. And then this question of whether to use force or how much force to use. Uh, I'd say this itself can be subject to economic calculation uh, in the right institutional setting. And then these last two points um, relate to some research I've done on police unions, where police unions uh, will negotiate in their contracts for increased job protections um, that make it harder to uh, punish them when they're being bad. So the, those are the last couple of uh, things we'll round out. So, yeah. so let's dive in. So a uh, pleasant picture here. So thinking about this trade-off between uh, dignity and security. So when you think about the mission of the uh, Transportation Security Administration, it is, I mean, it's, it's keep people safe while traveling. But there's this trade-off. I assume for now that uh, they're not engaging in security theater, that what they're doing actually uh, increases security. Um, but there is a cost to dignity. Even if, I mean, let's also assume they're publicly spirited. They want to find this optimal trade-off. Like, they don't just, and probably a lot of them don't enjoy this, but uh, somebody made the rules that they have to do it. Uh, maybe some of them do enjoy it, but, <laughs> it's, but say what they really want to maximize, regardless of whether they enjoy it or not, is that they want to find this optimal trade-off, that they don't want to engage in undignified acts unless the benefit in terms of security is worth it. But we have these incommensurate things. How do we measure uh, dignity versus security? Well, the thing is, when this is bureaucratically provided by the TSA, we can't. We, uh, it sounds grammatically funny, but we can't know. Uh, we can't know whether they're actually doing that. I mean, if we imagine instead in, uh, a different institutional framework, say the airlines themselves were uh, the providers of security, uh, the security screenings. I think that would seem incentive aligned, at least, that, I mean, they, want, they don't want to just um, be insecure. I mean, they have billions of dollars of capital goods at stake. Um, but they don't want to engage in security theater, especially if, well, maybe if they could fool people, but um, they don't want to engage in undignified acts if that's not actually increasing security. So if, uh, if that were a matter of choice among consumers, like you choose this airline and um, they offer, okay, maybe uh, you just you know, go through the metal detector and uh, what. Um, that through this competitive process, they could figure out the optimal trade-off between uh, what consumers want and also protecting our capital goods. But they, they wouldn't want to uh, unnecessarily <laughs> uh, inconvenience travelers because they want travelers to come, uh, come with us, but we also want to uh, make sure our uh, capital goods are protected. So it, I, I would argue that it's only through this institutional framework of private property and free exchange rather than a monopoly provider of security, that a bureaucratic provider of security, where this optimal trade-off can be uh, determined. And we can look at different examples of this. So, I mean, one more within the private sector. So this here is a picture at a Kroger in uh, Fulton County. So it depicts, uh, so within a Kroger grocery store, there's additional barriers with one entrance and exit. Um, looks like it's protecting things like uh, laundry detergent or other items. I guess these were the things that they found were more often stolen. And uh, you see the headline says, some customers upset over changes at a Kroger. So here, yeah, they're facing a similar trade-off, right? Uh, some customers may feel alienated by these additional security measures. Um, so you have the, you know, this decrease in dignity or convenience. And Kroger's only going to want to do that if that sufficiently, uh, say, de or, uh, prevents loss, if the dollar value of that loss uh, prevented is greater than uh, 
however many customers they might lose. If I mean, yeah, people will complain. They'll probably still shop at Kroger. Right? I don't know. Uh, but they, they don't want to do this unnecessarily. Right? They only want to do this if, and they can see in their bottom line, is this, I mean, we have the, I mean, the physical costs of erecting this uh, structure, but also, I mean, potentially lose out on customers, but also prevent theft. But only in this institutional framework of private property and free exchange can they determine this. A similar example of this, uh, this is a, a convenience store in Baltimore. You can see this uh, lady behind a lot of glass that, uh, to protect herself. And you know, people complain about this too. It's, you know, it's undignified, but um, uh, this entrepreneur behind the glass is determining, well, trying to determine and can do it because of profit and loss, whether it's worth even while well, operating a, a convenience store like this um, where, uh, well, faces an increased risk of theft. And, and even though this might alienate certain customers, like, oh, I feel like I'm, you know, a zoo animal here being behind this glass. Um, then turning to the second point, which, let me go back, constitutional constraints and security. So uh, Mises in bureaucracy talks about these uh, constraints. The bu bureaucracies are supposed to be subject to rules. I mean, that's what bureaucracy is. Right? Well, you can't calculate, so follow these rules. Okay. So he says, if one assigns to the authorities the power to imprison or even to kill people, one must restrict and clearly circumscribe this power. The law determines under what conditions the judge should have the right and the duty to sentence and the policeman to fire his gun. So this should be subject to rules. It's constrained. Um, it can't just depend on uh, officer's discretion. It has to be bounded within certain rules. But this leads to certain problems. So in line with this, quoting uh, the law professor Randy Barnett, uh, which he agrees with me, is you've got to constrain a government here. So, but this leads to a dilemma of vulnerability. So this, he says that a society that includes extensive public property holdings is faced with what might be called a dilemma of vulnerability. Since governments enjoy privileges denied their citizens and are subject to few of the economic constraints of private institutions, so that's the important thing, that they're subject to few of the, the economic constraints, their citizens are forever vulnerable to governmental tyranny. But he goes on to say, like, so if they're going to be, you want to decrease their being subject to governmental tyranny, so you put these constitutional constraints on them that they can only um, search you under certain conditions or um, certain conditions have to be met if they arrest you. But this dilemma of vulnerability is this leaves you vulnerable to um, others, non-governmental actors. So if we think about order maintenance in the uh, public domain or extensive public property holdings, as uh, Barnett terms it. So we, government police are con constitutionally constrained in their ability to maintain order in the public domain. So for example, laws against certain disorderly activities such as vagrancy or loitering or panhandling or soliciting for prostitution or public intoxication. The Supreme Court has voided these for vagueness. They say these laws are too vague. Like um, if this, we don't know if this lady, is she hailing a cab or is she uh, advertising her services? We don't know. This leaves um, police officers, I mean, they can, oh, well, if they're not you know, on the up and up, they might harass certain people. Um, so the, the Supreme Court says these are too vague. We can't have these laws. Um, because as they are enforced, they might be arbitrarily enforced. But if, so this is to solve the dilemma problem with uh, government police officers, but then it does leave you vulnerable to, you know, the vagrants, the lawyers, the panhandlers. Uh, so it's like, yeah, choose who you want to be vulnerable to. So that, uh, this is the dilemma of vulnerability. And so, so the problem is, uh, well, I mean, you think about Rothbard wanting to unleash the police. You know, you're on the, the strong side of the, uh, the trade-off. Because they can't, without calculation, they can't determine what the optimal trade-off is here between uh, well, this dilemma of vulnerability. So by contrast, um, if we think about private security, so these have a picture here of the Beatles of Burlington Arcade. They got cool outfits, but they're considered one of the oldest private police forces in the world. So the Burlington Arcade, it's not you know, video games, it's an upscale shopping area in London. And they have certain rules that if American police tried to enforce these in a public domain, it would be considered unconstitutional. So for example, uh, they prohibit whistling, 
because uh, whistling used to be this code among pickpockets in the area, so that, oh, no whistling. Uh, you can't make clucking noises, because this was a signal among uh, ladies of the night that the, their services were available. Uh, so you can't, you know, this ruins the decorum of the, uh, this upscale shopping area. But, so the constraint is, here is they're not constrained in the same way as, I mean, like, they don't have a First Amendment constraining them against, you know, if you consider clucking or whistling speech. But they're constrained in other ways. They don't want to make rules that uh, make this property uh, undesirable by consumers. They only want rules that will increase the value, or um, if they do it decrease the value to some people, <laughs> the value uh, is increased commensurately to others, but we can compare those because they can gauge in profit and loss calculation. Sorry if that sounds too much like a broken record, but like I said, it's like uh, the light by which I see everything else. If you, the, these things that you can know because of uh, the institutions of private property allowing you to calculate profit and loss. Uh, then moving on to this question of uh, whether to use force or how much force to use. So this is a picture of, uh, so a few years ago, there were these two men, well, they're being arrested here. They were in a Philadelphia Starbucks. And, and they were sitting in there. They didn't buy anything. One of them requested to use the bathroom. And they were told by the manager, like, you know, you got to buy something or uh, you got to go. I mean, we got a lot. It's a busy place. You're taking up a table. Um, and they chose to do neither. So the police were called, and the police you know, reiterated to them, like, yeah, you either got to buy something or leave. And again, they didn't do either, so they were uh, arrested for trespassing. And here, I mean, the police they basically did their jobs right. I mean, it was like, here's trespassing. Uh, Starbucks is fully within their rights to eject these uh, two men. But this ended up being an entrepreneurial error, like if you've heard about this case. I mean, it was a big PR disaster for Starbucks. Uh, they like, ended up closing 8,000 locations for a day for some kind of training. Um, I think the, <laughs> the, the, the CEO met with these two men. I think he might start a scholarship uh, in their honor uh, for young entrepreneurs. They, they said they were there to make a real estate deal, but they, they're wearing sweatpants. Um, so, anyway, so what I want to say, like maybe from a legal perspective, that Starbucks was fully within their rights, but um, from a, a profit-making perspective, an entrepreneurial perspective, it was probably better for them had they tolerated this nuisance rather than use force to uh, deal with it. And they can only know that because, well, Starbucks I mean, is, is subject to profit and loss calculation. Whereas, I mean, the police department, like I said, they, uh, the police department itself, they were acting as the agents of uh, Starbucks. But I mean, like I said, they didn't break any rules. They did their jobs as they were trained to do. Um, but uh, because this took place in a context where there's ca uh, economic calculation, they're able to determine whether it was worth it to use force here. And um, might I add, so the, the, you might know this, this saga continues with Starbucks and uh, enforcement. So uh, more recently, uh, a few Starbucks locations have closed because they went too far the other way. They became too tolerant. So uh, in Seattle, for example, uh, Starbucks employees were, I mean, just felt unsafe, too many people shooting up in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> uh, so if economic calculation allows them to see that they've gone too far the other way, right? So they're trying to find this optimal trade-off. I mean, we don't want to use force too much. But we also don't want to be, become too tolerant of certain behaviors that people don't want to come in here and people don't want to work for us. And those, uh, some of those locations ended up closing. But again, this is only because uh, Starbucks can engage in profit and loss calculation. Okay. So last couple things I want to talk about. So with police union protections. So police unions negotiate for job protections that make punishing police officers more difficult. Uh, this, we can f effectively think that as a, uh, or think of that effectively as a pay increase. So, um, I mean, it's like professor, granting professors tenure to the extent that that actually uh, gives them some job protection. I mean, if you think, okay, I got these two job offers, like this one pays this amount, this one pays the same amount, 
But they all, there's also this uh, chance of obtaining tenure. It's like, oh, well, all else held constant. I know what I'm picking. So uh, the one offering tenure could offer less uh, in wages to the extent that uh, people think job security versus higher wages is a substitute. The one not offering tenure is going to have to offer more money. And it's the same thing for uh, police officers. All else held constant, more job security will decrease the level of wages that have to be offered. And there's you know, pretty clear examples of this that I find interesting. So uh, in Chicago, for example, uh, there were years where the city is like, oh, you know, we, we don't have a lot of cash. We can't really uh, raise your pay as much as you want. And the, uh, the police union says, well, we'll take more protections in lieu of higher wages. And the, uh, the city's like, okay. And so you can see how the city might like this. They're like, oh, well, this is budget neutral. Um, you know, any costs that come in the, the, any costs that will incur monetarily will come in the longer term once we, well, which is what they found. They, certain officers with these protections, they were extremely hard to fire and creating these civil liability costs for the, for the city. But nobody remembers that when the, the decisions were made. And then later, so uh, the Chicago police, or the city of Chicago had this police accountability task force, I think Lori Lightfoot was on it, and they recommended getting rid of certain, the, some of these protections. They said this, because they're the police accountability task force, we want police to be more accountable. Well, these are protections, so uh, an example of a protection might be officers get fired they can appeal to a binding, an independent arbitrator. And about half the time, these arbitrators give them their jobs back. And they may, I mean, ostensibly, this is you know, to prevent arbitrary firing, because this is a, a very big issue that I won't get too much into, but with private sector employment, uh, private sector employers are relatively unconstrained as well. They, they're not trying to obtain pro profits. Um, they can, they, they have, they're less constrained in wanting, in being able to hire people they, they like who aren't necessarily more productive. And so, in that sense, public employees might be more um, vulnerable to firing, but then you have all these civil service laws or uh, union protections that make it harder for them to be fired. So anyway, I just want to set up that, what, what I'm talking about in terms of um, these protections, uh, but Oh, to finish that story about the Police Accountability Task Force. So they recommended getting rid of these protections. And the Fraternal Order of Police President came back to them and said, yes, we would be willing to uh, forego these protections. Just bring your checkbook. So if you pay us more, we'll get rid of these protections. So they clearly see these as substitutes. So this leads to, I think, an interesting question. So a, a trade-off between, say, lower taxes and greater police accountability. So. As I mentioned, some, at least some police unions are willing to uh, negotiate away protections in exchange for higher wages. But how much are taxpayers willing to pay? That's what I find interesting. You see certain surveys of people saying, like, yeah, the police need to be reformed. But the same surveys never ask, like, OK, how much are you willing to pay for that? Uh, I wonder, uh, well, may, maybe people are willing to pay. I don't know. But people seem to think that, oh, we should just get rid of these protections. Well, they don't think of the secondary effects. like. You've lowered police pay. Um, you're going to have a different pool of applicants, likely. Um, so th this is a trade-off here. And we can't, we can't know <laughs> what the optimal trade-off is uh, without markets. I mean, then it wouldn't be taxes, but it would be you know, individual buyers of security. Um, how much are they willing to pay uh, for greater accountability? And then I think this is an interesting political economy issue. And this, I think is related to the fact that uh, we can't calculate the optimal scale of police provision in a bureaucratic framework. So most uh, police departments are at some kind of municipal city level. And there's a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, there's you know, different people who, I mean, the people who are paying, paying the bulk of the taxes, the ones who would probably be like, yeah, give more protections, lower my taxes. Uh, they're generally not the ones um, suffering police misconduct. So. Uh, uh, just an additional issue where you have uh, bureaucratically provided policing uh, that you're not able to determine these optimal trade-offs because consumers aren't actually able to express their preferences in a market setting. I mean, you have voting, but um, that's just really uh, very crude at best. I mean, just not a substitute for determining 
opportunity costs. And then, uh, lastly, uh, a related issue, this trade-off between misconduct and what I'm calling depleasing. So the, the depleasing label is, or some have called it the Ferguson effect, that um, police officers, they're worried about getting in trouble. Right? If it's like, I don't want to be on the evening news if I you know, try doing my job. Um, and even in certain cases, as we found, like, I would argue, I mean, in my opinion, sometimes, like, yeah, they do things well, but then, you know, LeBron James is tweeting about them. Um, like, I'm thinking of the Micaiah Bryant case where it involved a, a woman about to stab another woman and a police officer a shooting, and it seems like, uh, in my estimation, justified. And it's like, well, uh, this led to a lot of negative publicity. Um, but uh, the point is, to the extent that police are able to, I'm just going to you know, stay in my car. I'm not going to be proactive because I don't want to put myself in more situations. Um, that, that's what I mean by depleasing. Okay, so I mean, a primary justification for these protections by those who are, are pro uh, more protections, such as qualified immunity. So qualified immunity uh, protects police officers from civil liability if they you know, violate someone's civil rights and are sued, if they, I think the legal conditions are, if they do so you know, in a, I guess, goodwill manner, to the best of their abilities, they didn't try to violate civil rights. And there's not a um, historically established, um, through precedent, that doing this thing uh, violates civil rights, then they're not going to be held personally liable for it. And the justification for that is, well, we don't want police officers to be afraid to use force in, in situations like this. Like, you're in a high-pressure situation where um, people are using lethal weapons. You don't want police officers, well, the, the, the argument goes that you don't want police officers to be hesitant to use force. But, but if you don't have these protections, then they'll, they'll pull back and engage in depleasing. So this is a trade-off. Like, you'd rather have more misconduct or... Um, depleasing if police are unprotected. Of course, say like this is only a problem when you have a monopoly provision of uh, you know, a, a government bureaucracy providing policing, where I mean they do have the they're less constrained. They can shirk. That's what I'm essentially talking about. They're shirking when they engage in depleasing. Again, if I like want to go sit in my car and eat donuts, that's shirking. Um, I can only do that because you know, there's not market competition. So uh, an entrepreneur trying to satisfy consumers wants to find this optimal trade-off. I mean, they want to minimize their liability. They certainly don't want uh, guys going out with guns blazing. And, you know, unless that, you know, maybe economic calculation will determine that to be the uh, most uh, efficient response. But no, they want to minimize their liability while also protecting clients. If they're shirking, if they're minimizing their liability too much, then um, a, a competing entrepreneur will provide uh, services that are better on that spectrum, like only minimizing liability to the extent that they're not uh, unjustifiably uh, leaving s their clients unprotected. Ah, so to conclude, uh, the, the provision of policing faces many entrepreneurial issues, as I've pointed out, uh, but bureaucracy is about strictly following rules. Uh, it's not a, I mean, it, it can't incorporate entrepreneurship. It's like, you just do these things, you know, like Joe Friday from Dragnet, like, just the facts, ma'am. You know, it's like, everything's by the book, you know. And then, you know, in those buddy cop films, you have, like, the by the book guy. That's the bureaucrat guy. And then you have, uh, you know, Mel Gibson, the, the lethal weapon. And, um, the, the, practically speaking, policing, is, it's not a standard situation. It's not like um, the DMV, where if you meet these conditions, I will issue you a, uh, a license. It's uh, not easily subject to bureaucratization in that way. And, well, not to imply that the DMV is easily subject to bureaucratization either. I mean, well, uh, there are trade-offs there too. Uh, I mean, Walter Block will tell you all about that. All the you know, tens of thousands of people dying on the road. Like, is this worth it? We can't know with, uh, without economic calculation. Uh, we have road socialism. So, so I don't want to I just don't want to imply that the DMV, like, oh, yeah, this is a gr great case of bureaucratization. Like, no, there are, I mean, maybe in worse costs there, too, um, of tens of thousands of people dying. So by moving 
policing outside of the realm of economic calculation, but making it bureaucratic um, contributes to a lot of these problems we see in policing. And I think one of the important implications in thinking about police reform is that, I mean, that might push you towards one side of the other of these trade-offs, but as long as you, like, reform but keep it bureaucratic, is not um, reforming in such a way that it's subject to private property, free exchange, these things that create market prices through which uh, economic calculation is possible, you can't resolve them. You can't find that optimal trade-off. So it's um, yeah, unresolvable in that sense. Uh, so that's, that's all I have to say for now. Uh, thank you for your attention. OK, I think we have about four minutes for some questions. So I think Manuel said it best. Keep it concise. Keep it about what was asked. Uh, be brief. No introductions, no anecdotes, no attention seeking. Have you done any research into like specific areas? I know Detroit at least was looking at uh, utilizing uh, private police forces uh, in order to help kind of rebuild their image by having better security. Do you know uh, how successful that was, if it's being successful, et cetera? Oh, well, regarding Detroit, I mean, a pretty well-known private policing service in Detroit is the, the Threat Management Center. Um, you can... So the purveyor of that, Dale Brown, um, he's got some great interviews with Tom Woods in which he talks about the things he does. I don't know of the uh, the state of Detroit, or not state, the city of Detroit, the government um, trying to utilize this. I mean, a big problem for them is that uh, it, they promise so much to their public employees, and so a lot of like much of what their like current taxpayers are paying for paying for policing is for services rendered in the past. It's to pay for retired police officers. So that, I mean, created a great entrepreneurial opportunity for Dale Brown to enter. So I don't know of um, the city being involved, but he himself, I mean, he has I mean, quite a profitable business, a lot of um, mostly commercial clients, but also a lot of residential clients. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if this, you think the city would be interested, I mean, uh, it might just be a death spiral, I think, as the things get worse, tax revenues go down. Um, but yeah, so I, if you're interested in Detroit particularly, and I'd say just private policing, I think Dale Brown and Threat Management Center, right, very interesting. Go check out those Tom Woods interviews. So in a system with uh, private policing, how would qualified immunity work? And if we were not to have qualified immunity at all, what would um, be the best way you believe? And I know you said there are, there's never a best solution, it's always about trade-offs, but um, what do you think the best way to keep them accountable would be? Yeah, so qualify me, I don't think any non-state actors, I, I think there was well, some legal battles over whether um, workers in contra, I, I don't like the term private prisons, they're all, you know, the government's their only customer, I call them contract prisons, there was some debate over whether they're qual. Uh, subject to qualified immunity, but uh, essentially in the privacy, you don't have this. Uh, there's, um, so there's vicarious liability. The, whatever the individual employee is gonna do, be doing, their employer is going to be liable. So there's not anything comparable to uh, qualified immunity, if that makes sense. Uh, they're like, either them as an individual or their firm is going to be civilly liable if they do things that uh, a court determines they uh, committed a tort. So, I mean, just um, this fits in well. I, uh, in the discussion about these firms, they want to minimize that liability. I, I find it interesting. Um, there's a Canadian private security service called IntelliGuard, and they were like really a, a early adopter, not of body cameras. Like they'd have guys carrying cameras around. There's actually footage of a guy getting like roundhouse kicked and he drops back up, but they did this to protect themselves, right? A lot of uh, police unions have fought against body-worn cameras, saying this changes their working standards so it's subject to uh, union negotiation, where for private police, they want to minimize their liability. Like, essentially, yeah, if you're doing things right, then you want that footage to protect yourself. So, say in these ways, yeah, they want to find that optimal trade-off. We want to minimize our liability, but not so much that we're not protecting our clients. So I'd say, yeah, you, you wouldn't have a substitute for 
you wouldn't have anything like qualified immunity. It would just be uh, that firm subject to civil liability, and so they have to find that optimal trade-off um, and compete with other entrepreneurs also trying to find that. All right. We are uh, out of time, so thank you, Dr. Fegley. Thank you. Thank you.